So welcome, welcome to the MMA Pulse with me, Brian Lacey. I'm going to be joined very shortly by Mr. David Moon. But firstly, uh, just to say thank you as, as well for everybody that watched the first episode of MMA Hype, Octagon Hype, uh, yesterday. Uh, had Pavel Neruda on the uh, on the podcast and also uh, Carlos Romola, two interviews there that were superb. And it's just a great intro into what is Octagon to get you all hyped, exactly what it says on the tin, uh, so that I can share with you my passion for what has become uh, a, a really um, fantastic part of my life, Octagon MMA. So thank you for doing that. You can check that out on the Octagon UK and Ireland channels. Um, and through that, we'll be doing that every two weeks. And then this, the MMA Pulse. What's the difference, Brian? I'll tell you what the difference is. Uh, we'll be doing long-form interviews with some personalities in and around Octagon, as well as some people from, uh, from the different sphere of MMA or the, the outside world as well. So some long form conversations here on the MMA Pulse and then Octagon Hype you can catch every two weeks and that will be a magazine show that will bring you uh, yeah, all the highlights, the reviews, the latest news and of course some great interviews. So speaking of great interviews, I am so excited to have this guy on the on the MMA Pulse. He's just coming off the back of a fantastic win at Octagon 34 for me as well, just a great personality outside the cage, a beast in it. So let's welcome him right now, Mr. David Moon. David, welcome. Hello, Brian. How's it going, man? Hey, it's good. Honestly, like I said, I'm so excited to have you on this this show. So excited That's to right. have you as part of uh, of Octagon as well. And uh, off the back of the performance, you took on Miguel Conrad at the the last show in the Stranit. So what what an arena that was. And then you put on this performance coming off the back of a very tough loss. You were very open with me about that loss. But the emotions, the performance, everything coming together, I had to speak to you. And I just have to find out how's it felt? What What's the response being back there in, the, in Canada from that victory? Well, I mean, as you put it, man, I guess like the people who are close to me know exactly everything that happened in the trip. Uh, a, lot, a lot of my teammates think I just went there comfortably you know, did my thing, came back home. They don't know about all the other crazy stuff that happened. But <laughs> overall, man, I'm I'm happy, man. I mean, as you said, uh, you know, I feel like that was uh, what, one of my best, actually probably the best uh, performances of my career thus far. And uh, yeah, I'm super happy and excited uh, to see what's going to happen from this point on out, man. Well, listen, we're going to talk about a little bit about what you hinted on there about the, the entry, the, the journey towards that, uh, that, that performance of your life. And it makes it even more impressive. It makes it even more impressive. But I want to talk about the fight, first of all, because mm -hmm. you took on Miguel Conrad after the back of the loss to Mate Sanekidze. Now, okay. you talked to me about the fight with Sanekidze and you talked to me about the grappling and, you know, just how, how hard you found it. Like, you, you, like you, you, you found his technique so good that you it's made you recalibrate where you sit as far as MMA grappling. And for me, you said I had to, I had a miserable camp. I had to go pick out the the toughest grapplers at TriStar or anywhere I could find them, the bigger weights. So it yeah. must have been awful. Like eight weeks of absolute hell to get ready for for this fight, but the performance said it all for me. Yeah, um, yeah, man. I mean, uh, uh, fighting uh, Mate definitely, you know. Just being real with myself, uh, I always felt I had pretty good defense, but definitely there were some exchanges uh, where he did things that I've, like, I've never been exposed to. Like some of his continuation after I would stuff uh, a double leg entry of his, continuing it, twirling around full 360. Like I've never, I've never felt these kinds of things, you know? So I wanted to, like you said, grab as, as highest level of grapplers that I could find and just you know, kind of put myself into that, that, that misery that I kind of felt in that fight, you know, and just getting used to it and finding ways to get up or get out of, get off the cage and, you know, going back to the striking game and, and whatnot. So, yeah, it was definitely a tough camp, man. Um, there were a lot of uh, national uh, uh, wrestlers uh, involved in this camp, um, guys who won uh, medals in the world games and uh, represented uh, in the Olympics for, for countries like Iran and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, man, I mean, definitely uh, it, it, it helped going into the Conrad fight for sure. And it just came through. Look, I'm, I'm, we talked about that, Mate Sanekidze. And again, there's that old adage, win or learn. 
um, and you did that. You went back and you learned. And I want to just show you this finish again. Let's share it because let's get excited about just how damn good you were this weekend, uh, David Moon. So let's you. have a little look at that uh, that finish. One second. Let's bring it up. And that movement, footwork. And oh. looks on point tonight. Does David Moon. Oh, oh me, the my goodness. 15 seconds left. David Moon looking to derail the train. That is Miguel Conrad. Can he do it? Elbows coming down now from the top. What a finish to round number one. That's it. That's it. He stopped it. My goodness. David Moon. <laughs> push on the striking clinic. He you said he was feeling fantastic. He said he had good rehydration. <laughs> yeah, everything went the right way. An awful travel here. Had so many problems oh. to overcome. But since he walked to this cage, since we saw him... Now, David, I'm going to get you just to talk through the emotions there because what a finish, first of all. And the finish doesn't quite do justice to the build-up to that because your takedown defence was so good. So yeah. good. Your movement was phenomenal. And and I'm going to say this as well. Comrade is, is, Comrade is one of the best grapplers that you're going to face. Whenever they did this matchup straight off the back of Santa Kidze, I thought they couldn't give you a tougher matchup. Somebody on a three-fight win streak and somebody right in that conversation at, at 145, but you switched on from the moment you entered. I could see it in your eyes. And you, mm -hmm. everything that you talked about came to fruition. It's, uh, it was so impressive. Yeah, thank you, bro. Um, fuck, man. Honestly, brother, I tried to re, uh, remember like, the, for the whole process. And I, 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 you know what, man? Honestly, maybe the difficulty of the trip worked better for me. The fact that I had no time to stress, the extra couple of days of being there you know it was just like my mind was always occupied with getting the passport in time arriving on time making weight on time and then and then having the day to myself and then fighting the next day you know i don't know what to tell you but definitely for sure man when i when that cage door locked um there was nothing that i had to force out of myself like you said everything just came out man my i i, I figured he was going to try to put me on the cage as mate did and I stayed long with my punches. You know, I didn't overcommit. You know, I started switching stance. You know, every time a guy goes up on me, man, I'm, I'm whipping my right kicks. I got, I got a hard right kick, you know, so push kicks up the middle. And um, yeah, like you said, the takedown defense was actually the most impressive because Spicy even said it. He's like, you know, in training, you're a little bit more relaxed, man. You'll give up a takedown. But yeah, man, I was on point. I felt on and... Yeah, I felt like you couldn't do anything to me as the round went, went on there, for sure. No, it, it, it was uh, fantastic. And like you said, you, you switched on. And you, we've talked about it. That, that we've hinted at it. Let's talk about it, the, the build-up to this fight. Because if that's the performance of your life and you have to put all the ingredients back together to have the same performance of your life, does that mean you've got to lose your passport before you get on the plane <laughs> next time? <laughs> what, what, oh, what, does this mean we have to do the thing? Because let's explain <laughs> to the people watching. We got this like Betty, first of all, Queen Betty, uh, who works yeah. for Octagon. She is uh, just a superstar as far as what she has to deal with. She does all the logistics for all the fighters and um, gets them yeah. all ready. Now, David Moon, David Moon, when you are getting ready for a fight, you've got enough to worry about with another guy trying to kill you on the other side of the cage. You need to get all the easy bits sorted, right? This is me. A little bit of friendly advice from old mate Brian to David Moon. Because <laughs> what we found out is that as you... Was, was it at the airport or was it before you actually went to board that you found out you only had like three days left on your passport, which which is not wasn't long enough for the trip. So you would have basically been committing to moving to uh, to Prague off the back of that. Bro, honestly, it's, it's my fault. I mean, I don't travel enough, man. I, I figure like, hey, you got a few days. I mean, I'm booked for... Uh, three four days before it expires i thought i was good that's that's totally my bad on my part and i, I don't know what to tell you i just <laughs> didn't even it didn't even cross my mind that it was going to be a problem now when i arrived and spicy had another flight along with my other cornerman uh gab and they were at the airport so i'm like all right i'm gonna see you guys inside they already checked through the clearance i get there man and they tell me like look man for europe you need six months like you're not getting on this flight man i was fucking losing my shit oh, excuse man. my language and uh <laughs> and uh man and right from there then and there i was speaking with betty and telling them like look i still got a couple of days let me try to get this passport you know waited from 6 a.m it opened at 8 a.m the following day went through that whole process of 
showing them the urgency, like, look, I'm, I'm a professional fighter, da 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 da. Long story short, man, I got it in two days and they booked me the first flight that was available and I just took it, bro. And so that was on a Thursday. We had to weigh in on Friday, right? On Friday, and, right? Uh, See? It was stressful. So I was like, man, I can't get there and, and expect to cut. I had I was at 158.8, Brian, and, and I was still waterlogging thinking I was going to arrive on Friday morning and I'll have to, they're like, yo, man, you got to fly out tonight. Like, and I was like, oh my gosh. So me and my girl, like she was wrapping me up the blanket. I started my weight cut here and I lost about 8.8 yeah. 8 pounds and on an empty stomach, boarded the flight. Total duration of the whole trip was about 11 hours. Arrived, man, and Spicy just brought me right to the bathtub and we just went at it. And wow. I had about five pounds left to go. Four pounds came off easy. The last pound, Brian, was the hardest one pound I had to cut in my entire life. It took about five trips for me to cut that one pound. Every time wow. I would, yeah, man, I would, every time I go on the scale, it was only like 100 grams off, 200 grams off, da 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 da. Betty comes downstairs and she tells us, like, look, David, you got 10 minutes left. Like you either make it or you just go in with the weight you have and just go on, go on with it, go move on forward. You know, tried it one last time, right at 66.3, man, made the mark. <laughs> Huge celebration, gave uh, Spicy and my cornerman a big hug. Like I just won the fight. And uh, yeah, from right there, we had to go straight to um, where the public weigh-ins was. And I remember being in the car, Brian, and, I'm like trying to rehydrate, drinking my carb drinks and whatnot. But I felt nauseous. I felt weak. Spice oh looks at me and goes, look, man, you're about to weigh in. And this is your first time weighing in front of people as well. You can't look like such a bitch. Like, fake it if you have to. Like, <laughs> I know you feel sick. And you see, yeah, so I had to fake all that, man. And, you know. And, oh, my yeah. God. <laughs> That's amazing. And honestly, well, like people that have never cut weight before uh, and done the water loading as well. Because when you water, like basically your body, you're just training your body to push fluid out, right? You're just taking on so much water. You are tricking your system into uh, pushing that fluid out. Then you have to get on a flight. This, the, the flight is, what, 10 hours from there? That's and it. I, and were you a middle seat, a window seat? Because if right you're going to need to like, go bathroom every worst. 10 minutes. This is the worst <laughs> is... part of it all, okay? I'm sitting in the middle between two women. Right when the food cart comes, bro, one lady got spaghetti with cheese. The no. other lady had chicken teriyaki. Uh, <laughs> that was the hardest. That, that was unbelievably hard, bro. And I'm, I'm out there just like uh, I asked for a cup of ice, you know, chewing on ice cubes just to hold me over and whatnot. Because you know? yeah, airplane food is, is not good, right? But when you are hungry and thirsty, yeah. anything smells good, right? These two yeah. ladies chowing down. <laughs> on uh, on pasta as well, mate, with cheese sauce. That's hideous. Horror. Did yeah. you choke him out? Did you just do a quick rear naked choke? <laughs> put him to sleep. <laughs> Clear the place. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so look, what one man, one man you've mentioned num a number of times is yeah. th the man, Mr. Eric Spicy. Now I've got yeah. a, a, a huge soft spot in my uh, in my heart for for Eric Spicy. What a guy! Yeah, what a guy. guy. Good energy badass as well but he, he was the one he was literally when you you came with him you cornered him when he was first fighting with octagon and uh yeah. straight away he wasn't talking about him he was talking about you he was like this guy needs a fight this guy and yeah, he came man. up to me separately and went this guy will kick any of these guys heads off <laughs> <laughs> so uh what's it like having him as, as a friend because i know there's there's also that thing like he, he he's, he's he likes a joke he likes to have a little dig he's, he's one of those guys so uh um, yeah. what's it like being around him and uh and having him as part of your team bro spice to me is like my brother my mentor my jiu-jitsu coach my training partner lich my manager now you know what i mean he's literally everything bro and um you know, our, our friendship actually started uh, uh, a few years ago when a little bit before when the COVID pandemic was happening, when um, a lot of the international guys were, were leaving Montreal, going back home and the gym got super small, man. And we were training with the same group of the core guys of, of TriStar. And and uh, that's kind of like when we clicked, you know, because prior to that, man, there was too many. There's just. TriStar is such a big gym with so many different fighters coming in back then that 
um, you know, you'll have little clicks, you know, some guys you're close with. Spice Lee wasn't uh, somebody who we were just close friends right off the bat, man. But like I said, when the COVID pandemic started, uh, I guess he kind of scouted me in some ways, man. He said, like, look, man, you got some talent. Like, um, you know, we started working together more. And, uh, and um, yeah, I ended up uh, having to corner him and helping him out with his striking for his first octagon fight. And, yeah, like you said, man, he really put me on, man. Put me put, put in an effort to really get me an opportunity. And, uh, you know, all praise be to God. When the opportunities came, I was able to, to, to perform, and, and, and here we are, you know. But um, yeah, as far as having Spice in my team, bro, like, honestly, it, it, he's literally half of the reason why, why I'm going to be succeeding as the level gets higher and higher, in my opinion. He was that one missing piece to my career who somebody with the experience and somebody who sincerely just is there to support me um, with his level of skills and, and everything that he has to offer, man, it was exactly what I needed. And yeah. And, and here we are, bro, like three fights into Octagon already. And uh, yeah, man, I'm truly grateful, man. Three fights in two mad finishes as well. That Kuznick one as well. That was, Oct was Octagon 28. Um, you fought Matej yeah. Kuznick. And that was upper weight class on short notice, huge underdog in that fight. And this is this is something that I remember on the the announcement. So Andre Novotny was announcing you, and I'd read the notes that he'd written, and he kept talking about submissions and jujitsu. And I was like, yeah. this this kid's a banger. This guy's got like taekwondo in his veins. Uh, and that's what happened. He, like you, I think he almost did you a little favor that um, he announced you as this supreme submission artist. And then that yeah. they did no one told anyone about that right hand. No yeah. one told anybody about that right hand, and it's uh, it was it was a it was a, a massive performance because you were on, on short notice again taking an opportunity, but going up a weight class. So what was that like? Because that's that's now got you two finishes in octagon. Yes, sir. Um, man, when that happened, you know, like I said, that was towards the end ish of the pandemic. So for that two years, man, I, I, I've been trying to compete, but no shows in Canada was happening, and and, um, and but I was helping out a lot of the the, the UFC guys uh, during those two years, man. That's probably where I made the biggest amounts of improvements as far as uh, developing my style that you guys are seeing now in, in the octagon cage, you know. And man, I was helping out guys like Mursad, uh, Arnold Allen, Joe Duffy, um, wow, <laughs> big names, you know. And really, you know, just getting the work in, putting the grind on for two years. And when that opportunity came with uh, Matuj. I'll be honest, Brian, I, I was shit scared, to be honest. Like, two and a half year layoff, like, and, and my first time doing, like, a public weigh-in, I, I, I couldn't uh, grasp how big the MMA scene was uh, in Czech Republic and Slovakia compared to Canada, you know, the amount of support from the fans, and this was all new to me, man, so I was uh, super excited, but, but definitely the highest level of stress I felt going into that fight. Because prior to that, I never had opportunities as grand and big as this one, you know? Wow. So, well, yeah. you, you, you grasped it. I say with both hands, but it was the one hand that, that did a lot of the damage, the right hand. And to say that you yeah. talk about those sort of nerves, you looked so relaxed. It looked like you were at home in that cage. And, and that, that came through. Um, you talk about the size of the shows and, and the experience. What's yeah. it like being with Octagon? Because the fans are great, right? There's there's a good interaction they have with the fighters, the the events, the um, and I will talk a little bit about the venue that you were just in in, in a second. But my goodness, uh, it's something different, right? Being part of this show, bro, it's unbelievable. It's definitely the the biggest experience of my career, and um, I'm really grateful and happy for for this for this chance, man. Like honestly, to oh my gosh, just just. It, it really makes me feel like uh, I, I'm progressing in the sport, being able to compete for a show as big as Octagon, you know, um, going from local small shows in different parts of Canada with, uh, you know, a few thousand maybe, you know what I'm saying, to elevating that to 12, 13,000 in a stadium with public wins. Like, this is crazy, man. It's just, <laughs> yeah, man, it's, it's, it's unbelievable, man. It's, it's Look, really let's... Awesome. let's Let's share because if people didn't see, let's let's show the uh, let's show the venue that you you walked out in. So this is the Svanitsa, and I'll, I'll tee it up because um, they they do. This is the smallest show they do. 
This is seven and a half thousand people in the open air arena. It's basically, I describe it as their Super Bowl. So it's mm -hmm. like a landmark event for them. And okay. whenever I see it, and I, this, this video came out, that's the arena. Wow. That's where you fought, dude. Oh that's God. a drone shot. And not only oh, that, there's a yeah. halftime show with the fireworks. This this is dream stuff, right? Because uh, like, and the UK the UK scene hasn't got this sort of thing. But what in the UK scene, there's still some smaller shows that do um, um, nice nice size venues, two three thousand. Then there's the right. big ones that like the UFC will come and they'll do the DO two. Um, right. But no one's putting on a show like this. The other the no other way. fight cards are all in sports halls and things like that. So so what what's it what, what's it like when you walk out in these moments? What's it like when you um uh you yeah you you walk out into an arena like that dude honestly i'm trying my best to just just look at the cage because as soon as i go start looking <laughs> past the cage or above and i see how high the seats are man the nerves just gets worse and worse you know so i mean i was doing my best to just kind of look down or look straight and, and not be phased by all the cameras and the lights and the the size of the fans man but how does it feel i mean it's, I, it's it's unbelievable man honestly i i don't know what to tell you even um you know in the fight when you're in a stadium that big with that many people when you hear the oohs and ahs that like it, it really hypes you up man you know you it really helps you i guess kind of f get into that flow zone you know what i mean where you're just letting loose because the crowd is reacting to it every time you do something cool or something wild or you get a clean shot they're, they're like, oh, and giving you the ahs and clapping for you, and you want to do it more because it feels good, you know? So, yeah, man, it's uh, it's uh, definitely a feeling that I can't really explain in words, but it's crazy. It's unbelievable. Uh, and and your style, my friend, your style is fan-friendly. This is what I like <laughs> because I, <laughs> I, I believe that – I don't know what what numbers you got on Instagram, but I think three, four fight, more fights in Octagon, and those numbers are going to go through the roof because you, you look the part, your fighting style is phenomenal. Um, you're getting those finishes as well at, at Featherweight, which is great. Um, you talk about fan interaction, and um, I, I'll just show you, this is again the arena. This is this is going, the oh, fans are something special. But I know you had one particular bit of fan interaction with with one guy who, uh, who, who had a, his own experience of your fight. This guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, funniest experience, right? Oh my god, because I, I know the, the team, right? So I know the team, and one of the guys, Honza, yeah. uh, Honza Novak, came up to me and said, The funniest thing's been happening. There's Tom yeah. and Gu in here, and he keeps getting people coming up to him and congratulating him on, the, on his contract. <laughs> with so he spent the entire night getting people asking for photos. <laughs> like, I'm not okay. David, man. Yeah, he actually brought like a few fans over to me, like, Hey, Moon, I got another one, you know, they want to take a picture with you, man. I was like, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, but I even like the post he did. So he did half moon and full moon. I think that's <laughs> great. Big shout out to Tom and Gwen. That's that's yeah, uh, that 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 made my uh, that made me smile a lot. Just <laughs> just seeing the fact. And my friend Honza was saying so many people because there's seven thousand people. There's so many people were coming up to him and saying uh, congratulations. But they were they, there's there's been a huge buzz off that win. That I think that you, yeah. you claimed there. I mean. When you look, and I don't know if you do this, I don't know if you look at the featherweight division, I don't know if you, you you sort of look at styles you'd like to be matched up with. Is there anyone that you kind of think, do you know what, if if I'm not, I don't particularly believe you're a call-out guy. I'm not thinking you're one of those. But is there anybody who's, that you, you'd like to share that cage with? Yeah, I mean, as you said, I don't have anybody specifically in mind. But, I mean, speaking on a, like a, set, like a st style that I would like to compete against, um, yeah, for sure, man. I would love to go up against another guy who, you know, likes to likes to strike, likes to keep it on the feet uh, as well as I do, you know. Um, uh, just to do it for the fans, you know. I, like I said, I love to I, – I love it, man, when, when I'm feeling in uh, on rhythm and just, uh, uh, you know, going up against somebody highly skilled and, 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 and trading shots and playing that chess game and whatnot. So, yeah, I mean, I would – I mean, Matuj and Mate and uh, Conrad, in my opinion, they're, they were more stronger-ish grappler types. So, yeah, I mean, I would love to go up against another striker in the featherweight division. You know what I mean? And, uh, yeah, that'd be cool, man. 
There's um there's there's I'm not the matchmaker, but there's there's one guy yeah. who fought on that card. There's two guys actually that fought on that card, David Coretta and uh, Roman Paulus. And Roman's only loss is to Conrad. And right. his style, I mean, he is super impressive, and, and you can't help but be impressed because he's 22. He was the winner of Octagon Challenge 5, which is the TV show they do over there. Um, okay. His fighting style is phenomenal. He's got such high fight IQ for 22 years of age. And yeah. I think he's nine, nine and one now. And that yeah. one is Conrad on, on one of Conrad's wins on that three fight win streak. And for me, just skill set wise, I think it's a nice matchup. And I think it's relevant as far as the division because it's not not just a nice fight because you're both that level but it's a nice fight because it could have implications on you know moving forward towards that belt yeah i uh, i agree man i think uh i think he's a good fighter he's a good striker for sure um i, th I think the only problem is is that i i feel like just because of the reason of the management that we're under uh i don't I know are you managed yeah. by the same? Oh, mate, I'm yeah. not that guy. I've tried to start a fight at a dinner table. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, that's probably what I see as uh, as the only problem. But style-wise, yeah, no, for sure. I think he's uh, super composed, super mature for his age, man. And, and I, I respect the skill set. But again, somebody like his style, I would love to, bro. Someone with his uh, experience and record and, 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 and the style that they fight, man. Yeah be sick bro uh yeah but it would just come down on what the, the management thinks yeah. yeah that's i didn't i didn't know that i think i think yeah i didn't i didn't realize so my my bad that's uh um but again it's just me respecting those two fighters and obviously you two both fought on that last card that familiar opponent you've got a win against him he's got a loss um right. we've got we just had a question drop in it's quite a nice question as well let's let's throw it in so David, every time you walk into the cage, you wear your headphones. Do you have a special uh, type of music? What what music do you listen to when you walk in? Um, Thank you, Villain, uh, for that question. Yeah, it's, it's actually not music. I'm uh, because of my religion, man. When I when I feel high stress, I just listen to Quran in my ear. Uh, it's uh, it's the book that um, it's for our religion, Islam, and it's like an audio version of it, and it's just on repeat. But that's pretty much what I'm playing. Literally the minute I arrive in the venue to walking out, you know, uh, just to keep me calm, you know, it's it's just something I do for myself. Yeah, that's interesting. No so it kind of grounds you. It just gives you that that center before you go in and do what is absolutely mad as a job, my friend. It's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, yeah, that's it, man. That's exactly it. Um, question because, over them. Yeah, it's just you know, like I'm sure everybody feels it, and I'm sure you know too. It's just. To be honest, I think being backstage on fight day is probably one of the hardest things for me, at least. Uh, just trying to stay focused and whatnot, um, you know, not letting all these negative thoughts or the crowd and whatnot bother you in any way. And that's what it helps me do. Listening to Quran just kind of, like you said, keeps me grounded and helps me focus on what I need to do. Um, you've talked to me quite openly about how the, the, the Muslim religion has really helped you and, and given you focus, discipline, direction. Um, you've also talked about how, how MMA helped you as well in a similar way to, to, to change your life. I've never yeah. talked to you really about where you were or where you're at, but you, you said you said it in the terms of basically it did save my life. And uh, I don't know if yeah. you're, you're open to talking about that, but what, what was the journey you were on and, and what brought you into to mixed martial arts and, and the religion of uh, uh, of being a Muslim, uh, yeah, man. I mean, you know, I'm I'm in I'm in my thirties now, but like, you know, being a teenager, you know, coming from a broken home, uh, you know, alcohol involved in the family between the parents and whatnot, had me uh, making a lot of dumb mistakes, man. As a young kid, no real guidance, no real role models in my life, and uh, got into a lot of trouble with the law from about uh, sixteen till about twenty. And uh, I had a very short uh, stint in, uh, in, in prison for, uh, for like uh, drug trafficking. And when I came out uh, from jail, uh, I was trying to go through, I was kind of going through like a transitional phase where I was trying to detach myself from the old environment, the old groups of people I was hanging out with. Um, just based on what I saw in, in jail, you know, you see a lot of these old timer gangsters talking about their glory days, but like they're in here or they're gonna be dead in some time, you know? Uh, so, so yeah, when I was going through that transitional phase, I 
tried to go to school, man, enrolled into college, just did a bunch of random things to, I guess, normalize myself, if you want to put it that way. And um, one day, man, I saw like an MMA gym. Uh, I never really knew much about the sport aside from whatever I learned from playing uh UFC undisputed video game, you know, and and I just went to go try out a class that I had a local gym there. It was ran by uh, Coltar Gill, an East Indian Canadian fighter who was a pretty big name uh, with K1 over in Japan there. Yes. And man, yeah, my first class, I was hooked, Brian. I was like, you know what? I don't know where this is going to take me, but I, I just love this so much. It's learning different elements of fighting from not just striking the grappling, the wrestling, the submissions. And, you know, 10 years and a half later, here we are, you know, and, and actually, sorry, I forgot to mention after coming out of jail and trying to go to school, um, I did find this slam about uh, a year and a half after just kind of seeing one of my best friends uh, convert to Islam first and seeing the impact that it has had on his life. Um, who, 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 who also shared a similar kind of lifestyle as me. And I saw how it kind of took him away from that and gave him peace in life, researched it. It made sense. I accepted Islam. And then a year after was when I did my first MMA class. So it was wow. kind of, yeah, it was kind of one after the other, you know. And when I found these two things, Brian, it just simplified my life. I was just training twice a day, you know, going to the mosque or going to Ram uh, doing Ramadan and whatnot, you know gave me uh, guidelines, I guess, to, to find peace and contentment in life, you know? And, uh, yeah, here we go. <laughs> hey, well, from me, and I'm sure from a lot of people, I'm proud of you, my friend, because Thanks, it bro. takes a lot. That No, 100%. It takes a lot. I know, um, I, yeah, I know people who've been on certain paths and they're, they're stuck. They're stuck. And it, the, the hardest decision is... To, to break free the hardest moment you, you have to do and it's not easy because mm -hmm. life is sticky it's not like you can have a clean break from everything around you um right. so to even do that and then to to move into something which which is the total opposite that gives you all that discipline all that direction whether it's your faith whether it's what you do as your pastimes uh it, it's it's huge and like you said here we are 10 years later and you just walked out in the most ridiculous arena, you just got a finish in front of seven and a half thousand fans, hundred thousand watching on the on the stream, and you changed your life with those moments. Whatever that self reflection, whatever happened in the past, has built the man that we've got in front of us. So uh, it's it's super impressive, my friend. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that, man. That's good. So uh, look, we, I said uh, we're we're in David Moon's home as well. So tell me a bit about home life. What's uh, who's around you, and uh, what, what do people think of this this journey you're now on? That you're uh, absolutely smashing, mate. Yeah, I mean, originally I'm from Western Canada, like uh, in a suburb near Vancouver uh, called Abbotsford. Once I uh, hit a plateau of progression uh, in my MMA uh, career, I moved to Montreal, man, which is where I've been at for the past um, eight years now. And uh, here, man, I got my my girl and our two boys, a uh, family of four, about two cats, man. And uh, <laughs> it's been simple life, brother, you know. Um, the best, Montreal, though, right? The best. Yeah, it's the best, bro. Just simple living. And, uh, you know, Montreal, one of the most beautiful cities uh, in the summer. Um, yeah, man, just uh, enjoying life and uh, just training hard and trying to reach some goals, you know. That's about it, man. Well, you're getting there, my man. You're getting there. That Thank win you. is one huge step towards what's next. And let's let's ask what's next. We've got people already asking in the in the chat what what your next opponent would be. We kind of touched on that, but what's what is the what happens now? 2022 has got plenty of gas left in this tank. I know the prices of gas are pretty high at the minute, but we're willing to spend <laughs> it on getting David Moon back over as long as he's got a passport going. Um, <laughs> what when when's when you're thinking about getting back in there have there even been talks are you trying to you know yeah. push to, to make something happen quickly because momentum is key right and uh and also those experiences we, we've only got a short time to do this life and uh you need yeah. to get back in there especially if you've come out unscathed yeah no doubt um yeah for me brother i'd like to go in as soon as possible uh Maybe in any show that they might have coming up in November or December, I would love that to get another win uh, before the year ends. Um, as far as goals go, man, look, Brian, I'm only looking up top, man, wherever that is. You know, maybe next year if I continue performing the way I do, man, Bushinger, you know, 
like just go up and fight him and test my skills against somebody uh, a legend like himself you know like there's nothing more brother i just want to keep going keep on performing keep on putting on shows keep on finishing guys man and just uh man I, 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 when i started this sport i didn't think to myself i'm i'm going to be go to the ufc or i'm going to be one of the best strikers or whatnot i just i just loved it and just progress started happening happening and you know sometimes it takes time for you to believe in yourself you know but slowly i'm almost there i'm not completely like confident in me at times although sometimes i am but I see glimpses, man, where, where when I'm on, like, when I'm on point inside that cage, bro, I really feel like I can compete against some of the best guys in Europe or the world, you know, and that's what my goal is, you know, just to keep going up, keep on performing, and let's see where it goes, you know. Dude, dude, we believe, so now you need to believe, okay? This is the key. <laughs> I remember this, because like, you're a lovely, shy character outside the cage, yeah. so humble. I can't tell you what a nice experience it is just having you on the shows my friend it's it's like a joy just seeing you not not when you've cut weight after being on a plane for 10 hours <laughs> but once you're rehydrated and we can sort of hang out it's it's an absolute honor and a pleasure to to know you to know your story and now to call your fights as well david moon so whatever happens next um i'm excited to see it because with those statement victories two and one in octagon now two finishes against legitimate uh, opponents so you're making your own path my friend yes, sir yes, sir uh, yeah man just uh continuing uh you know man I, after i got back man i went right back to the gym uh you know coming back from 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 losing against the uh, santa kids it was a little bit different i was more going into the gym because i had to because as you said i had to work on these weaknesses that i've noticed in the fights it was a drag bro it was forcing myself to go into the gym every damn day but coming off a performance like that and the fact that i'm not injured i'm going right back bro i want to make my weapon sharper and, you know continue making uh some of the weaknesses that i have um, you know overcome them make them stronger and uh yeah man like i said i would love to fight one more time before the year ends um the thing is you know spice and i we kind of got this like uh I need Spice. That's what I realized. Uh, I, I don't know if you noticed, but for Santa Kid's fight, uh, Spice wasn't able to come because he was yeah. supposed to fight uh, on that day. But, man, it's just really... I'm not saying he was the reason. Him not being there was the reason why I lost. But I feel like him being there, somebody who knows my style and knows me and knows how to get through to me in the cage, would have maybe clicked, perform a little bit better than I did, you know, against Santa Kid's. So... Uh, why I'm mentioning that is because uh, we're waiting for Spicy to fight in October, and uh, you know I'll be there to corner him and whatnot, and and hopefully we can schedule something after after that date so I can have Spicy out there again, you know. So uh, yeah, yeah. I shared a taxi with him. I shared a taxi with him to the airport, and he said exactly the same. He said whenever he fights, I need to be there. Whenever I fight, I need him there. So yeah. brothers in arms, my friend, brothers in arms. Yeah. Speaking of arms, we've got one more question. Jump in on the uh, on the chat. What is tattooed on your left shoulder, my friend? Ah, Stefano. It's just a just a dragon, man. You know, me just being... a dragon. Look at the just size a... of it. My God, that looked like it hurt. Yeah, it's just a dragon going on my chest into the back. Uh, man, I was like 17 years old when I got it. It was literally like 17 years ago. But uh, yeah, that's all I got. Um, I, I love tattoos, but you know, it's not really looked good upon uh, uh, being uh, within within the Islamic religion. It's it's so I'm kind of just uh, leaving it at that. You know, I got it before. <laughs> I don't think I'll be seeing anymore, you know. <laughs> it's 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 held the test of time though. Sometimes when you see people with tattoos they got when they're 17, you really can see that they regret them. But that's a solid tattoo. That was a good choice, <laughs> my friend. 17 year old you, high five. That's what I'm doing. Look, I'm, I'm gonna let you go, my man. I'm gonna let you go. Honestly, a pleasure to talk to you. Um, and I cannot wait to see you get in there. David Moon, congratulations once more on that victory. And um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your day, my friend. Thank you so much, Brian. It was fun uh, speaking with you, man, and I'm excited for the future, brother. Thank you. Okay, that's it. Take care. There we go. That's David Moon. What a guy. Oh, my goodness. I can't tell you just 
what a pleasure it is to have him around on fight week. Um, just a great energy. And then he switches that energy to those performances in the cage. So will he get the fight before the end of the year? We will find out that uh, as time progresses, but hopefully so. Uh, once again, thank you for tuning in. This has been the MMA Pulse. This will come at you uh, sporadically. I will be dropping these with various people as the weeks go by. Very excited with some guests that we've got coming up. Also, Octagon Hype, that launched yesterday. If you want to check out exactly what all the hype with Octagon is about, then you can go to that show that's on this channel, Octagon UK and Ireland's channel. Um, the first episode dropped yesterday with Pavel Neruda and also the one and only the light heavyweight champion, Carlos Vermola. So once again, guys, I want to say thank you for tuning in. Uh, keep following and we will see you next time.